welcome, thank you. So I'm gonna tell you three stories from my life, three lessons that I learned, that's it. Now after these 15 minutes, I'll probably never see most of you again, but maybe one of these lessons will stick with you and help you create a career that you love as much as I love mine. Because if you love what you do, you'll never work a day in your life. When I was six years old, I fell in love with the origami. You've probably all seen those paper cranes you fold out of a single sheet of paper. Something about this just fascinated me. And I got an origami teacher, I went to origami conventions. Over the next couple years, I was obsessed with origami. And as a kid, this is a great hobby to have because everywhere I went, there's always a sheet of paper. You go to a restaurant and you get that paper placemat you're supposed to color on, so I'd cut it into a square and I'd fold paper. I went to church and they'd pass out those little flyers, brochures of what the agenda was and I'd cut it up. The worst case, <laughs> A parent always had a dollar bill around and I could do special folding with a dollar bill. Now after a couple years of this, this interest got replaced by skateboarding. That was my new obsession. And then a couple years after that, it was Legos and computers. And I had a few false starts in there as well. Karate looked really cool in the movies. <laughs> so I signed up for a karate class and after a couple classes, that just wasn't for me. I tried piano and oil painting and those were a couple false starts. But my childhood was really marked by this series of intense passions that I pursued. The thing that I noticed is, as I got older, high school in particular, there was less and less time for my interests. In high school, between schoolwork and the homework that you had to do, it was pretty much all consuming. And on some level, I just accepted that this is the way things were, this was part of growing up. I mean, I didn't really like it, but high school is when you're supposed to get serious about things or something like that, that they tell you. And so by the time I got to college, I was really looking forward to it because I knew you got to pick a major. And I knew what I wanted to major in. I wanted to major in computers. That had been the most intense and longest lasting phase of mine. And I loved everything about computers. I loved building them and programming them and playing games on them and hacking them. And this is what I did with my free time. And so the idea that I could make this my major, I mean, this, this was obvious. And if for some reason computers fell through, I had three other things on the list that I thought would have been fun majors to pursue. But one thing really surprised me when I got to college, and it was the number of people who had undeclared majors. I mean, for me, this just, it baffled me. Like, how could people not know at least one thing that they wanted to study? I mean, I had lots of things that I wanted to study. But the more I talked with people and, and just thought about it, it, it didn't surprise me too much. Because you spent 12 years in school where your interests were basically irrelevant to other people, and irrelevant to what you were focusing on. And now all of a sudden you're supposed to know what you wanted to do with the, rest, with the rest of your life. On some level I started to realize that school may not have been the preparation for the future of my life that I had thought it had been. And I felt fortunate that I'd squeezed it in on the side all, all these years. So I began pursuing computers with a new level of intensity. I was really excited when I discovered that people would pay me $30 an hour, sometimes even $50 an hour to write programs for them. I mean, I liked writing programs for fun. And so I had a T1 line in my dorm room and I got a couple servers under my desk before long and I was hosting websites for people and they'd pay their bills every month and this was just awesome. A couple years into this, I brought in a co-founder. We ended up hiring some students to help us write programs for people and this was starting to turn into a real business and my interest in school was lessening and lessening as, as, my, interest, as my business was really developing. But by the time my senior year came around, I find myself in a really funny situation. I hated my job. And the weird thing is I created this job and it was centered around an interest of mine. So how could I have gotten stuck in a, in a career you know, for, during college that I hated? But somehow, I, just, I remember really distinctly, I was sitting in class and my cell phone would vibrate and I would just get this knot in my stomach. It was another tech support call. And I'd run into the hallway and I'd answer the phone, like, hello, yeah, how can I help you? Oh, you're having trouble getting logged in? Oh, well, yeah, do you know what your password is? Do you have your caps lock key on? Like, oh, caps lock, yeah, that'll do it. <laughs> so glad I could help, you know, thank you very much. But after the hundredth time, I was really not glad that I could help. I was <laughs> so sick of those calls. But I actually felt stuck. I felt like I had all of these obligations and commitments that I had made, and. I just didn't see a way out of this, and I did not love what I was doing day to day. And so it wasn't long before I resolved that I was gonna get out of this. And by halfway through my senior year, I sold the company uh, to a, a local co competitor, and we handed off all the contracts and all the obligations, and it felt great. 
And it wasn't long after that that I dropped out of college, and so I really felt free. I felt like I could do whatever I wanted. But it wasn't long before I really felt myself in an odd situation where I didn't know what I wanted to do with my life. I didn't know what career I wanted. And I could actually relate really well to those people I met freshman year who didn't know what they wanted to major in. And it seems odd to ever be in a situation where you don't know what you love, because it seems like it should be so easy to know what you love. But I'll tell you, it's hard. The voices in your head of what other people expect of you and what your parents want of you and what society has crowned as prestigious and, and, and recommended, like those voices are so loud. And the voice in your head of what you're interested in and, and what you might find fun, that's a really soft voice. And you have to learn how to listen to it. You have to learn how to feel, how to be in touch with what your emotional response is and what your hunch is. And, and then you have to try something and get all absorbed in it. And you're surprised. Sometimes you love it more than you don't. Sometimes you like it less. And it's over time that you really develop an understanding of, of what you're interested in and what your strengths are. And, and, and your passion is something that you nurture and, and, and create over time, over, over this extended process. And so I started something really interesting. I, I just I asked myself a simple question. I said, what do I love doing with my time when I'm taking a break from work and from, from school, you know, just on the weekend? And you know, one of the first things that came to mind is, well, I loved reading Popular Science Magazine. It's not such a good magazine anymore. But at the time, it was a good magazine. And it was just one thing I did to relax. And I hadn't read it for a couple of years. I'd been so busy with school and with this company. And so I went to the library all day. And I just read every back issue that I had missed out on over the last couple of years. And it was awesome. And I had a point where I loved playing video games. And so I found a, a, a new video game. And for a few days, I just, that's all I did. I just absorbed myself in it. Then I went to the bookstore, and I just wandered a, a whole day around the bookstore and just noticed like, what sections caught my interest, what titles. And I just pull a book off the shelf and read it for a couple hours. And I just absorbed myself in this. And something about this mode felt so different than the mode that I'd found myself in the last couple years, where I was just committed. I had all these commitments and expectations of me. And so I started getting more systematic about it. I made a list of all of the things that I'd loved doing in my childhood. And origami and Legos, like they were on this list. And I just systematically revisited each of those. And some of them were just for a day, and some were for a week. But I was very intentional trying to remind myself what was it that I loved about this? Like, what attracted me to it in the first place? And what was the common thread through all these things? Like, origami and Legos, they feel so different, but there's something that they have in common, and computer programming, and, and I was trying to understand myself better. And after a couple months of this, I got a really clear picture of what I wanted to do with my life, what, what I saw as an ideal career. And I had some statement I, I wrote to myself. It was something like, you know, I love learning about new science and technology and understanding what the applications are. And I love thinking about what new kinds of products might exist. And I love buying new projects, new gadgets, and new toys. I love toys. And, and playing with them and, and understanding how they were made possible. And I love explaining all this to other people. And so somehow, I wanted that to be a job. And that wasn't a job at the Career Services Center. That wasn't listed anywhere. <laughs> and, and I had a blank sheet of paper. And I wrote very concretely, you know, a day in a life of this job, you know, and I had a half dozen things on this list. And it was things like, I want to be able to read popular science and have that count as work. I want to be able to buy these new products and play with them and have that count as work. I want to be able to bring some of my own product ideas to market or work with the people at companies like Nike and Motorola and Fisher Price who bring out the kinds of products that I love and somehow be, be involved in that. And I had a few other things like that. And then I just set out to reverse engineer, like how could I find a job that let me do all these things, or create a job that let me do these? And that was a whole process in and of itself, but over six months or a year, I eventually figured out and created that job, and it was great. And so the lesson here is just really that your interests and, and your, your hobbies, they're sacred. You have to take them seriously. You have to pursue them. And the voices that you'll hear of all of what your parents and society and school, what other people expect of you, they're really loud and they'll drown this out. And you just have to carve out time for it and you have to take it seriously. And you'll come to understand what you're, what you're really passionate about. And you'll create this passion over time. So sophomore year of college, I was halfway through this company that I was building. 
And at some point, we decided that we wanted to hire some college students. We had too much work to do for ourselves. We were making some money. We didn't really have enough money to hire a whole team of people. And so we were brainstorming, like, how could we hire a bunch of students to do programming for us and do sales calls? And it was, summer was coming up. And we had a number of friends who were doing internships, some of these unpaid internships. And they got college credit for them, some of these. And we thought, well, that's awesome. Like, what if we could give college credit for our working for us? Then we could get all these people to work for us for free and wouldn't have to pay them any money. So we thought it was a great idea. And we went to, uh, we sort of scouted around online and we, we went to the, to the various college websites and we tried to figure out how we could register our internship with the school. And we found this semi-official process where you register an internship and you create it and you get approved by someone and it turned out not to be as hard as we thought. And so we had an official internship that you got some general engineering elective credit for. And then we advertised it on campus and we had a whole bunch of students apply. I remember going to the Career Services Center and I, I show up in my suit and, and the woman at the desk says, oh, sorry, your interviewer isn't here yet. And I'm like, oh, well, actually, I'm, I'm here to interview students myself. And then they let me into the room and then the students show up soon after that and we did interviews back to back to back. And ended up hiring five students that summer and it took a friend's apartment that was bigger than ours and he was gone for the summer and so we turned it into an office and we sort of had a real company then. It wasn't just a few of us. Uh, it was awesome. And this was really an important lesson for me where you know, sometimes there's, there's another option that other people haven't presented to you. And then if you think about things differently, you can find this, this other option. Now, I'll give you another example of this. Um, when I moved in with my girlfriend for the first time, the two of us had an apartment. Uh, she's now my wife. And the two of us both hate cleaning. And it's not that big of a deal. A lot of people hate cleaning. You know, every two weeks or months, you have to just you know, clean the apartment and the toilet. I hated cleaning toilets. <laughs> And most people just resolve like, oh, this is something you do. It's part of growing up. And, but we didn't want to do it. And we didn't really have money to hire a housekeeper and pay someone. And so we just, I remember sitting down at one point and we were brainstorming. Like, what could we do with an hour of our life that can make us enough money to pay a housekeeper so that we would never have to do this again? And it wasn't that hard to come up with something. Like, we didn't, it, it, this is just a break-even proposition. If I could make $20 or $30 or however much the housekeeper costs, then I could never have to clean again in my life. And we were both very excited by this prospect. And we figured it out. And I don't think, think I've cleaned a toilet since then. <laughs> and the same attitude, I mean, there's so many examples of this. Like, when I go to a restaurant, there's a menu of options. And half the time, what I want isn't on the menu. And I just ask them if they can make it. And almost always, they'll make it. And, you know, you ask nicely. Or if I'm buying a cell phone and there's three cell phone packages, I'll ask for an exception and I'll explain what I want the package to be and half the time they'll give it to you. There's so many situations in life where people present you this predefined set of options. There's three doors and which, which door would you like to open? And most of the times I want to open door number four and it's not an option. And I've learned that you just ask for exceptions, you understand what the rules are and the policies and why they're there. And you can come up with win-win situations where you get what you want and the other people get what they want too. And you, I'm so much happier. Like, so you can do so many things that, that you thought you couldn't have done. So find door number four. So last story. A few years ago, I was sitting in a meeting with Mark Zuckerberg at Facebook. At the time, I was the manager for Mobile Messenger, the, the iPhone app or Android app. And there was a problem with Messenger we were discussing where the messages that you sent to your friends, they were just too slow. Like you'd type a message, you'd click send, and you'd, you'd hold your friend's phone right there. And it would sometimes take a second or two before the message appeared. It doesn't seem like a big deal, but you, you'd pull up a competitor's app and you'd do that and you press send and it would just pop up like that. It was 100 milliseconds or so. And we, we unpacked this problem and the engineers explained why. And, and there were very good reasons why our messages were slower. Uh, it was an unintended side effect of, of some of the architecture that we had done, and there were many advantages to the architecture. And you know, the simple answer is just to accept this as a trade-off. But Mark and many other people were frustrated by this, and so over time, the engineers were working on trying to solve this problem. And after a few weeks, we were in a meeting, and a senior engineer was giving an update, and Mark politely cut him off and just said, look, I just have a simple question. Can you solve this problem or not? If not, I'll find someone who can. And with, soon after that, the problem was solved. <laughs> and the thing that struck me about it was that Mark himself didn't know how to solve this problem. He didn't understand the engineering to that level. But his assumption was that it could be solved. 
And if this person couldn't solve it, there was someone in the company who could, or maybe outside of the company if he had to. And this was just an attitude that he and many other people at Facebook took to so many things. And not just engineering problems, even something as complex as something like social convention. I mean, if you say hello to a friend, there's certain accepted responses that your, your, friend, your friend will give you. Or if, you send a message, or if a, mess, a friend sends you a message and you choose not to respond to that message, you send a signal to them. There's, there's all these unwritten social conventions which govern how we interact and what the significance and meaning of that interaction is. And even things like that, Mark wouldn't hesitate to question those things. You know, why do people respond this way? Well, what if they responded differently? And what if people didn't make that assumption when the following thing happened? And, you know, I, okay, we could change that. I realize that might be a little uncomfortable. But if enough people did that, wouldn't people just get used to that new way over time? Doesn't everyone agree that would be better? Well, how could we change that? And these are my words. These aren't Mark's. But this was the tone of, of the discussions that he would have, even about something like a social convention about how everyone responds to these situations. And it's really no surprise that Facebook.com and, and Instagram and Messenger and WhatsApp, I mean, all of these are Facebook's products. It's no surprise that Facebook's products have changed the way that we in, communicate with people, with friends. They've changed the nature of relationships that we have, the number of relationships that we have, the quality of those relationships. And all of that is very intentional. It's very deliberate, just with this implicit assumption that if you understand how the world works and why things are the way that they are, you can change them. I went to Facebook with the goal of learning some very specific skills that I, that I felt that I didn't have. I'd started and sold three companies. I felt like I got stuck and there's a few lessons that I needed to learn and I had a few friends at Facebook and I knew that if I joined a company like Facebook based on what I'd heard, then I have the possibility of learning those things. And then I walked away with this much more important lesson in addition to this, the skills that I wanted to gain. And it was just this attitude towards life that all of these problems, once you identify them and once you understand the cause of them, it's possible to change them. You can change the way the world works. So these three things, for me, have been instrumental in helping create the career that I love, a career that I'm passionate about. And so I just want to leave you with that. I just want to leave you with this idea that your interests are sacred. Take them seriously, pursue them. <coughs> and the world doesn't have to be the way that it is. You can change it. And just start looking in life for door number four. People will present you with these predefined options, but there's always another option that no one's, ask, that no one's offering to you. So never settle, and if you love what you do, you'll never work a day in your life. Thanks.